center and a ping pong academy. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 35th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. These calls are held every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. My name is Scott Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, the subject for this May Day is COVID-19 and labor. My guests are Eileen Boris, Silvia Federici, and Juliana Feliciano Reyes. We are streaming on YouTube Live. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter. My Twitter handle is at US of Disaster. You can also hear the COVID calls recorded as podcasts. Just go to soundcloud.com and connect to the COVID calls podcast. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for guests and future topics. On Monday, we continue our May Day labor discussions and we turn our attention to maintenance and maintainers with Jessica Meyerson, Andrew Russell, and Lee Vincel. As of today, there are 3,276,373 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 3,255,454 cases yesterday. 1 million 70,032 of those cases are in the United States, up from 1,056,402 yesterday. And there are now a total reported 63,127 deaths in the United States, up from 61,857 yesterday. I have been thinking these past weeks about a very specific place, and that place is Deering's Nursing Home in Odessa, Texas. Deering's is the place that my grandmother lived in the final years of her life and where my grandfather spent his mornings and afternoons at her bedside for years while they talked, napped, watched television, looked at photographs while he cleaned her room, tended to her needs, where they lived the domestic life at the end of decades of marriage. And even though they've both been dead for a while now, I've thought about them so frequently in these last weeks and oddly, maybe not oddly, I don't know, I've worried about them. Um, and some sort of anxiety that seems to carry forward even though they're gone. I've also been thinking about those many people, the women and some men who provided the care at my grandmother's bedside day in and day out. The bonds of friendship grew with many of them and yet they had their own families at home to tend to at the end of their shift, long shifts. From the manager of Deering's to the staff of the kitchen and the maintenance man and the nurses and those who did the cleaning. Deering's was a community of care workers. And though I saw them and spoke with them whenever I was there, only now do I feel like I have some deeper insight over the risks that they faced every single day in that workplace. Because Texas is doing a poor job of reporting COVID-19 impacts on nursing homes, I'm not able yet to know how the disease has impacted Deering's nursing home, but I know it must have. These issues of entanglements, family, work, care, life and death in intimate spaces. I wanted to talk to experts who could help shed some light on that, particularly in the context of labor and celebrating this May Day. So let me introduce my guests today. Eileen Boris is the Hull Professor in the Department of Feminist Studies at UCSB. Her many research interests include the home as a workplace, the valuing of women's labor, the connection between public and private, the ways that state policy reinforces inequality and the failures of welfare reform. She has combined scholarship with activism, working with trade unionists, disability rights activists, senior advocates, and others to improve in-home care. She is engaged in participatory action research as part of the Women's Economic Justice Project. She is the author, among many works, of Caring for America, Home Health Workers in the Shadow of the Welfare State, co-authored with Jennifer Klein, and Intimate Labors, 
care, sex, and domestic work as an editor with Raquel Salazar Pereñas. Silvia Federici is a feminist activist, writer, and a teacher, and is Professor Emerita of Hofstra University. In 1972, she was one of the co-founders of the International Feminist Collective, the organization that launched the Wages for Housework campaign internationally. In the 1990s, after a period of teaching and research in Nigeria, she was active in the anti-globalization movement and the United States anti-death penalty movement. Through these years, she's written books and essays on philosophy and feminist theory, women's history, education and culture, and more recently, the worldwide struggle against capitalist globalization and for a feminist reconstruction of the commons. She is also the author of many works, including Wages Against Housework, Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body and Primitive Accumulation, and Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons. And my third guest today, Juliana Feliciano Reyes, is a journalist covering work and labor for the Philadelphia Inquirer. She previously worked as a reporter and editor for technical.ly, a local tech news site, and her stories have appeared in Wired Magazine and the Washington Post. A native of Northern New Jersey and Manila, Philippines, she's a three-time Philadelphia News Award winner and has served on the board of the Asian American Journalist Association, Philadelphia Chapter, since 2012. Welcome, Juliana, Sylvia, and Eileen to COVID Calls. Thank you. I also want to just say a word at the beginning. I want to thank my friend and colleague, Jacob Remus, for helping to organize this special, uh, this special discussion today on COVID calls. So please send questions and get them in early. You can send your questions into the YouTube live chat, or you can um, put them up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag me at US of Disaster. So I'd like to start the way I have been starting all of these calls, just by finding out the situation where my guests are. So Eileen, if I could start with you, um, where are you calling in from and, and how are things there? Hi, well, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be with my co-panelists whose work is so admirable. Thank you for your labors, all of you. Uh, I'm calling, I'm here from Santa Barbara, California, which we think of as, you know, La La Land, as a, an area where, uh, People are just totally privileged and there's the beach and the mountains. But Santa Barbara County is a, macro, uh, a microcosm of the inequality of America. Uh, it is a place in which the working class is disproportionately immigrant, Mexican-American, uh, and that the cost of living, people are shelter poor. Right now, I wanna highlight three aspects very quickly of where we are. First, that the, while the numbers of reported COVID cases in Santa Barbara County, North County, South County, uh, North County is an, more of an agricultural area, more of an immigrant, more of a disenfranchised area, are, is about 500. The largest outbreak is in the federal prison mm -hmm. in Lompoc. And that is very much uh, in par, on par with many other areas of the world uh, where people are incarcerated, where there cannot be sanitary uh, procedures, uh, where people are um, disposable. Okay, so that's one thing. Secondly, uh, that, I, that I'd like to, um, point out is that our students, our graduate students have been on strike. They uh, have been on a cost of living strike. And in fact, the graduate students in the whole UC system. And, and I'll talk about that later, but to un COVID has played a role in exacerbating the uh, inequalities that we already had. And it's had an impact on organizing. And today is May Day. And so uh, a larger community organized by CAUSE, the Coastal Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, which is in the forefront of immigrant worker rights, is uh, having a number of uh, stay in your car uh, protests uh, later this uh, early evening in Ventura, in Ventura, in Santa Barbara, and in North County. 
Well, thank so that's you. where we are right now. Yeah, thank you for situating us there in California. Sylvia, can I turn to you? How are things where, where you are? Well, you know, New York has been considered the epicenter of the crisis in the United States, and the situation now seems to be improving because the number of deaths has diminished, but the situation is still extremely, extremely serious, and particularly, as I think is the pattern all over the country, particularly in the Black community and immigrant community. These are really the places where most of the deaths, most of the infection is now taking place because also people don't have a, a choice. So, you know, the, the epidemic has brought out all the crises mm -hmm. that uh, pre-existed. So the fact that people don't have, uh, you know, social distancing, yes, but what about housing? Housing where you're piled up or the homeless, you know, and uh, you also have a situation in the nursing home. Many, many people are also dying in nursing home. The jail, the jail situation is disaster. Shelters uh, also have been a place, you know, many people now are in the street. They don't want to be in the shelter where people are completely piled up. So all the problems that, uh, you know, have existence now are really coming to the surface. The fact that so little, so few resources have been devoted to actually, you know, really guarantee people's lives. And uh, so today, however, is a day of protest. There is a motorcade that mm -hmm. made of bicycle, cars, motors that is going all across the neighborhood, particularly from the Bronx to Queens to make the connections, mm -hmm. to make connection and there is a strike. No, we are not supposed to buy anything today. Today is the day of Novine and it's the day of really making visible what workers are facing and how little compensation and reward is being given for what they are doing. And uh, so we hope that starting this, uh, you know, this motorcade is really the culmination of a whole process of organizing that has been going on for many days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we're looking forward to some of the changes that this is going to bring about. Sylvia, thank you. Juliana, let me turn to you. Are you in Philadelphia and or wherever you are? Can you give us a, a sense of how things are where you are? Yeah, uh, I'm here in West Philadelphia, so not far from Drexel. And uh, I'm here in my, in my bedroom, which is also my makeshift newsroom and has been for the last uh, month and a half, which has made uh, the work-life balance thing kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in Philly, officials say that we are past our peak, though we are not close to reopening. Uh, some counties in Pennsylvania are in the process of slowly reopening, but Philly is not there yet. Um, and and yeah, today I today I took the day off. <laughs> Good for you. Um, um, shout out to my mom, who's actually watching right now. Uh, she's in New Jersey, and um, because of this, because of YouTube Live, she can tune in. Um, and she was telling me to get some rest, so I took the day off. Today. Um, though I, so I kept my phone off for most of the day, and then when I turned it on, I had um, a series of texts from different workers. Saying, like we're we're doing protests. Um, there's one at like at the VA hospital. The healthcare workers were doing a protest today and grocery store workers down um, in Center City at this organic grocery. And, and that's kind of like a look at, those are the texts I'm getting like all the time at workers saying we're doing this, like, can you come cover it? So uh, thank you for taking this hour on your day off to have this conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, Sylvia, let me turn to you. I have a question for you first. I'd like to ask you in the midst of this social distancing, you know, the home in the United States is now the locus of work um, for many more people than before. And maybe it's exposing that it was always a locus of work mm -hmm. anyway, um, exposing reproductive labor, housework, making things visible. How do you see the struggle over valuing women's labor more generally at this time? Well, I think, uh, you know, what it, at the center, I will start saying that at the center of this crisis, of the crisis posed by this epidemic, is the fact that we live in a society that systematically 
devalues the work of reproduction, but fundamentally devalues the life of workers, the life of people who are not uh, rich, are not controlling capital, who are not accumulating wealth. And I think that devaluation, the systematic devaluation, you know, is certainly reflected, expressed, you know, in the devaluation of reproductive work. It's not considered essential work, right? Even when we hear about essential work, you know, people do not associate that with the work which is carrying on every day in the home which is an immense amount of work because it's the work of caring for children, caring for people who are sick, et cetera, et cetera. It's the work that carries on life on an everyday basis. It's not the only work, of course, but it's very, very important. Now, we, I think, looking at the question of reproduction, housework, we can see that this has been a terrain of crisis all along. You know, it's been a terrain, and as I was saying before, this epidemic brought to the surface has revealed underlying crises that have been there. You know, housing, you know, what to so is social distancing, you know, when you have housing, you know, that where people, particularly in a place like New York, you know, that mm -hmm. you, yeah, you are really uh, pay a huge amount of money, have no space to social distancing. And, uh, you know, the question of nutrition, for instance, you know, you have to cook every day, those who are, and at the same time, you don't know, you don't know if what you're feeding your family is something that is going to kill them or not. Because even in the best of cases, you know, even if you don't lack the resources, but which most people do, right? The agriculture and food production are so much under corporate control. They are so contaminated that it has become really a problem to ensure that people have a good, a good uh, food, good nutrition, right? And uh, the double shift now intensified. Now everybody, I think thousands and thousands of people see but that problem was there to begin with. And I'm thinking now, when we speak of the nurses, when we speak of the people are working in the shop, what happens when they come back home? You know, and uh, we are thinking about making their life better on the job, which is crucial. Absolutely. But also what happens when they go back home? You know, after spending 12 hours, when maybe they have a child, what happens to the woman who is not married, who doesn't have a partner mm -hmm. and uh, has to take care of children? And so it's really a major, major crisis. But I think that what has to be emphasized, and I hope that this is uh, uh, the recognition that the crisis was there to begin with, mm -hmm. that this, this epidemic is not the cause of the intensifies and reveals underlying crisis. And uh, unless we deal with the causes of those crises, we are going to face more epidemic and more problems in another form. This is not going to be the end. And I'm very scared when the, I, the, I keep hearing, oh, well, in the fall is going to come back. And you know we can expect more to come back. Because in the end, you know, what is telling us is preparing us for a state of permanent crisis, mm -hmm. but also hiding the fact that we have already lived in a state of permanent crisis. We live in a state of really reproduction crisis on a day-to-day -day basis. And we need to change. We need to revalue the process of reproduction. We need to bring more resources to it. We need to change the, for example, food production, the relationship between agriculture. You know, now we have an agriculture that produces poisonous food, right? So the peasantry people are producing the food are dying of cancer with all the pesticides. And we are also dying of the diseases mm -hmm. and the lack of nutritional value, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, you know, uh, we are talking now about 63,000 people have died in the United States. At least. I think that, yes, uh, but every year, hundreds of thousands die of cancer. Mm -hmm. Cancer is now epidemic, mm -hmm. and yet we don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think it's very important to see where the attention is focused. So I very much hope that this situation now in bringing more attention to the home, right, is also bringing attention to what I see as the most fundamental underlying cause, which is really the devaluation, devaluation of reproduction, devaluation of housework, is devaluation of our lives. Eileen, you've written about uh, in complementary areas, and I want to turn to something you've written, just published just now in, in Descent, um, and uh, two weeks ago, and I'm just going to give a little quote from it. You said in this article, um, during the coronavirus pandemic, those whose workplaces are homes are in a double bind. Many employers fear contagion from those who by necessity move from home to home. Some fire or lay off their carers, transforming a health crisis mm -hmm. for these individuals into an economic one as well. Others ask caregivers to shelter in place with them rather than return to their own homes. This is a tremendous article and um, some echoes there with what Sylvia was just discussing. But can you take us into this issue, what you call the double bind and tell us a little bit about home care and home work and what you see is happening right now? I wanna, I wanna backtrack historically a bit uh, to this crisis in reproductive labor, which we could say is even longer, but let's take the point when Sylvia became really active and I was sort of listening to these things, uh, uh, being slightly younger, uh, and that's the 1970s. How did we solve the crisis of reproductive labor in the well-off areas of the industrial North? We solved it by what I call insourcing the labor of other women. That is, while historically well-off people and not so, so well-off people uh, brought daughters of neighbors, they brought uh, racially and uh, ethnically and caste other people into their home to do those, those daily quotidian labors that we associate with housework and care. Uh, in the, by the 1970s, you had more and more uh, women from, from middle classes in, in the US, white women going out to work. And, but rather than uh, reorganizing much the reproductive labor, rather than really, in some cases, some men took up some of the slack, but rather than having public uh, resources, the solution at that time was importing workers bringing in other people. Now this had long had been a, a crisis for African-American communities, but by the mid 1960s, black women were trying, were fleeing from even paid domestic labor. Mm -hmm. And for a brief period, there were more options and, and white families didn't want black women because they were too uppity anyway. So we, so in, in that moment, the solution was to bring in immigrant women, particularly immigrant women of color. Well, now that situation is mm. we see that double bind today because uh, women who migrated, the transnational mothers that so many people have been talking about, uh, leaving their families of origin back in their countries of origin, mm. but sending remittances back are now the people who are coming into these homes and going into nursing homes as the aid workforce and doing private uh, home care. And this is, the same people uh, circulate between individual homes, institutions, et cetera. Some are documented, some aren't. In some areas of the country, it's African-American women who are still doing this work. Well, their families depend on their low wages. Mm -hmm. they, and the families and the individuals that they're coming in to do that reproductive labor depend on them mm -hmm. for other members to function. The um, International Domestic Workers Federation and uh, domestic worker groups in the US talk about their work making the, the is the work that makes the world oh, wow. possible. And I think that's really important to understand. So this double bind 
is the workers going into homes and yet they're not being protected. The individual employers, but even these nursing homes and institutions do not provide anything for health and safety. And these workers are also not even in the health and safety laws. Now we can talk about the problems with those, but exclusion is always a problem. It's a mocker of disposability. So it's really important to understand that. So, so they're being exposed in California, it was first the wildfires and the mudslides and now the pandemic. And they're being asked not to go back home, stay with us mm -hmm. or they've been fired. Mm -hmm. So what is a health crisis and a crisis of health and safety in the job becomes an economic crisis for individuals, but not only those who have journeyed to the United States for these jobs, but for their families at home who are not getting the remittances. Thank you so much for that perspective. And I think it ties in really well with what Sylvia was saying that this is a disaster in this moment, but it's an inheritance of a whole set of problems and injustices which are of long making and which are socially produced yeah. and economically produced. Juliana, let me turn to you. If there's anything in, in what we've heard so far you wanna react to, but I also wanna ask you about one of your recent stories. Your reporting has been great and I wanna ask you about one of your recent stories. So um, if that's all right, I wanna ask you, you had a story uh, in the Inquirer just a few days ago um, in which you're talking about um, subcontractors. So we're moving out of the house here slightly, but I think another really important perspective here. And from the piece, you said the coronavirus crisis has shined a light on how some workers are left out in the cold as more employers contract out services. Even before the pandemic, labor experts, you write, and organizers have called the American economy's move towards subcontracting, whether that's through temp agencies, contractors for services like catering or cleaning, or two-tiered workforces, a race to the bottom in which workers get paid less and face more dangerous, precarious working conditions. I mean, yet another angle on this in which we find out all of the work that somehow is invisible, I guess. Can you say more about this, this story and what you, um, what you found and, and what the story accomplished? Sure, yeah. So in the early days of the pandemic, a lot of my coverage was around workers who were getting laid off. And I was finding um, that many of them were subcontractors. So we're talking about airline caterers, the, the people that prepare the meals for that um, people eat on planes. Um, we're talking about cleaners and security guards and stadium, um, stadium workers. And, and many of them were just sort of cut like immediately. And, and it suggested this like, uh, again, as um, Sylvia and Eileen said, of like these work workers being disposable. Mm -hmm. um, another example that we saw was um, healthcare workers in the city jails, they didn't get the hazard pay that all the other city workers were getting. And the city said that that was on the contractor to give it. Mm -hmm. And so, so it was really this sort of like, and, and we see this all the time in subcontracting, uh, this like shifting of responsibility. So the, so the host business points to the contractor and says, well, it's on them. And then the contractor says, well, it's on the host business because they're not paying us like this, like the, enough to give these benefits or pay more to our workers. Um, so yeah, I think the with subcontracting, it sort of revealed what a lot of people already know, what a lot of workers already feel is that they're they're sort of like they're not getting paid enough, and um, they're not they're not getting the same benefits as workers who are direct employees, and and this was just one of those things that um, uh, like exacerbated that. Let me um, stay with you, Juliana, as, as well. Um, you know, you've been covering um, the attempts of workers in Philadelphia to react in real time to the pandemic and keep, um, keep their unions alive, but also to have labor actions. And being that it's May Day, I know you wrote about a, a strike in a nursing home in South Philadelphia. Can you tell us that story? Sure, yeah. So, so last week, um, and this is a situation that's sort of been, that's been brewing um, among the, there's, there's a nursing home in South Philadelphia called St. Monica's. 
and um, workers there are facing all of the issues that essential workers, um, workers that are deemed essential right now are facing. So a lack of protective equipment, um, a lack of hazard pay, um, what else? Yeah, like just sort of feeling like they, they don't have the power to take care of the people they're caring for. Um, like they don't actually have the, the agency to take care of these people in the way that they want to. And so last Friday, these workers who are represented by District 1199C, a healthcare union here, they took a strike vote and overwhelmingly voted uh, to authorize a strike. And so they're not on strike yet because um, as per labor law, they need to give a 10 day notice to the employer. And so the soonest that could happen is um, May 3rd, which uh, May 4th rather. So Sunday night, um, like at 12.01, if they don't get uh, if they don't get what they're asking for from their employer, then they're going to go on strike, which could have really, um, you know, it could have uh, very like sort of massive consequences for the residents at this uh, 180 bed facility. So they, um, the workers, talked to me and said that there were more than a dozen people had died over the last two weeks, um, as of last week, and. And it was having a really, a really stunning impact on their mental health. Mm -hmm. One of the nurses said, "Like, we're all going to have PTSD after this." Um, and they were just like, and seeing these, this is like a long-term care facility where these workers are um, have grown bonds with uh, with the people that they care for, and they're just watching them die. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, yeah. It some of some of the stuff they told me was just so stunning, like. You know they don't have enough medical gowns so they were told to use garbage bags um that the residents weren't being the residents who had tested positive weren't being isolated from the residents who hadn't tested positive um yeah that the, the workers weren't allowed to use their paid time off um like to uh yeah if they felt sick it, it was just sort of just this long list of like how can how can these be the working conditions for the people uh, that are yeah that are deemed essential right now? So there must be some concern also that to have an action a strike in this moment opens the possibility for criticism and painting them because there's such a strong rhetoric. Even the president two days ago put out an executive order that now meat workers or essential workers. And the rhetoric around that immediately means that it, it's wrapped in a sort of, um, if they were to strike or if they were even to protest in any form, then they're somehow unpatriotic, uncaring, letting down the broader population. I don't know among the workers if they've expressed any concerns along those lines or how do you, how do you think they address that, that concern of being painted in a particular way at this time under this crisis? Yeah, no, that's a really, it's a really good point. And I've talked to some experts about this and they're saying that actually this is a time of like widespread public support for essential workers. Mm. So people are people are seeing what it's like for these workers. Again, like this lack of equipment, um, just sort of the unsafe conditions, the dangerous conditions they're working in, this like lack of uh, government protections for them. And so it kind of makes it, um, uh, a strategic time even for these workers to go on strike because there is this uh, this sympathy or this empathy for them. And, and we're seeing this, um, you know, in New York City, uh, as Sylvia, did you, ha have you seen this where like there every night um, people clap out their okay. windows to thank the essential workers and, mm -hmm. and you're seeing even like, I mean, I saw the other day on TV that an ad, Bad. yeah, different ads like thanking essential mm -hmm. workers. Um, at the same time, selling cars is very confusing. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's yeah. there's really this this discourse around these workers being heroes, which which I've also read a lot of good writing about being like, well, that suggests that nothing can be done to change these workers' situations when there are things that can be done to uh, make these working conditions better. I want to remind people that you're listening to COVID Calls and my guests today, Eileen Boris, Sylvia Federici, and Juliana Feliciano Reyes. And you can get your questions into YouTube live chat 
or you can uh, tag me on Twitter at US of Disaster and get a question in. I wanna stay with this line of discussion for each of you. And um, you know, one of the things that in the sort of social science uh, disaster research is pretty clear is that disasters are moments where pro-social possibilities are also revealed. Um, and, and there are limits to that, obviously. It doesn't rewrite the whole script of society all at once, but it does open care possibilities. And I, I wonder, you know, to use um, the language of the commons as you have, Sylvia, and, and maybe even sort of seizing the commons in this moment, what sort of new social arrangements may be possible in the midst of COVID-19? I'll leave that as an open question if any of you wanna yeah, it's, take it's that. It's a big question. It's a big question because in a way, in a way, from my point of view, and I don't think I'm alone, we really need to really change the logic of the society in which we live. Because uh, everything, everything, all the problems that we encounter are political problems. Uh, this is not a health crisis. It's, it appears as a crisis, you know, the manifestation is that of a health crisis, but it's really a political crisis. It's a political crisis because, for example, we know that uh, the economic policies, what we call neoliberalism of the last three decades, not only in the United States, but even more across the globe has completely dismantled or reduced enormously, you know, the support, the resources for the sanitary system, right? So that why, why in the United States, the richest country in the world, why was not prepared Right, you had to, you know, import uh, masks from uh, from China or, uh, you no, know, et cetera, et cetera. This is a scandal. This is a scandal, and it's not accidental. Mm -hmm. It's not accidental. It's just in time healthcare, you know, just in time reproduction, right? So that anything that happens, it's it's a will conscious decision to put, you know, wealth to put accumulation to put profit above people's lives. There's nothing accidental. Unless this, it's understood, organized around and changed, we are going to repeat and repeat. Everything is going to be a palliative. And uh, so I think there is a great, great possibilities. Every crisis right, opens up a possibility. On one side, the fear is that, you know, corporate power is going to use this crisis to reorganize work, reorganize the industry, you reorganize in such a way as to actually be able to exploit people even more. And this is really a fear. Uh, on the other, a very, a very reasonable fear. Yeah. Uh, on the other, I think is also the possibility, a lot depends on how we are going to respond and how we are going to respond, not to the immediate, the immediate crisis, but respond in a broader, broader sense. You know, the question of health, for example, we need to relocalize. We need to relocalize, for example, the, the structures of healthcare so that you don't have only the citizen and the hospital. But for example, in many, many places, and I've been talking to a lot of women in Latin America, women also from Africa in the last weeks, mm -hmm. and we recognize something that uh, you know, in the past, even in poor country, for instance, there used to be structures, small clinic at the community level, places where people could go to the community, in the neighborhood, you know, it, without necessarily, mm -hmm. return. and they also had a certain amount of control. They would know the people there, they had a certain amount of control. Communitarian reproduction, mm -hmm. what we call communitarian reproduction, Similarly, agriculture, right? I know we have this very good institution like uh, community supported agriculture. That's very important. The places, the consumer in contact with the producer, but that's still a small amount of that activity. You know, now uh, food agriculture is in the hand of corporate power of the Cargill, et cetera. The devastation the crisis and amount of death that is going now, now in rural area across Latin America, Africa, mm -hmm. people are dying of fumigation, pesticides, 
and the food that we eat. So it's a whole reorganizing. It's a reorganizing of the basic structures of reproductive work. And uh, so to me, clearly, and this is what I've been writing now for a long time and on the basis of experience, on the basis of looking at what in many, many places, women in particular are already doing, right? Which is retaking into their hand, reclaiming the control over reproductive life, mm -hmm. creating new forms of reproduction. For example, more collective, more communitarian, less individualized. I mean, one of the, of the problems with this crisis is also the individualization of responsibility or social distance, stay safe at home. Right. This can only be solved collectively. The change that we need is something that calls for collective action, for coming together and beginning to see what we need to do, what we need to do to retake into our hand control of our reproduction. Ensure the more resources are placed, you know, at the surface of reproduction. In individuate the, the areas of crisis, which are many, which are many, right? And confront the state, confront the state from a different position, from a position really of a, of a different kind of social fabric mm -hmm. that we, we create by restructuring reproduction and well. I want to say something about New York, you know, because mm -hmm. we hear many praises about um, our mayor and, and our governor, but you know, in the middle of this crisis, they are hiring many, many cops to discipline, to arrest people who are jumping the turnstile in the subway. People are jumping the turnstile in the subway because they have no money, because the cost of the subway is too much. In the middle of the crisis, you know, so many places for essential workers, the, the subway system, the MTA has cut the number of rights mm -hmm. cut and reduced because they were not making enough profit because lesser people, fewer people were traveling. Work, right? That means that those who are now traveling, the essential worker are traveling packed. Mm -hmm. So the social distancing, it's also a very hypocritical call because they know that many people cannot really do it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think there is a great possibility. This very much depends on how much people are understanding that our life are interdependent and that we cannot solve this crisis simply by making sure that we are safe, we don't contaminate our people in a very individualized ways, but we actually deal with it collectively. And I one thing that really yeah. uh, heartens me uh, so we're in the middle of uh, a graduate student uprising at the University of California. And it's through the performative learning to do mutual aid that I think a new generation of activists is being forged, forged across all the workers within the university system, uh, including the student workers, the undergraduates, including the maintenance staff, the uh, Kohler, which was a cost of living movement, which were wildcat strikers on our campus led by women of color, queer people, people who are first generation students who had the most to lose, but also had the most experience of what it means to do without and the most need. I've set up mutual aid and are aiding those who don't have shelter, who don't have food, are creating uh, packages of essential supplies. And this is part of movement building. And it reminds me of the, the gap, which we often see between the immediate demands of a crisis moment. So the CARES Act and its uh, implication for higher education is, well, you throw some money at the universities. Uh, they're supposed to give a certain amount out for students, for our graduate students. It's like $650 per student that qualifies and you have to be a citizen. Well, I mean, and you have to fill out some uh, free financial aid at, uh, form to qualify for that. 
while $650 doesn't even pay one month's rent to the university over, uh, uh, landlord uh, that you have. But there are visions, a group of us have put together a call for reform of higher education that would go beyond just giving money right now to keep institutions open, but just as airlines had to do something to get federal money. So the universities should be restructuring so there are not contingent jobs, but good jobs. The universities should be uh, ending, well, not the universities, the state, student debt. I mean, there has been uh, yes. a number of uh, mm -hmm. proposals. The latest is just as the Fed is buying up Wall Street debt, why doesn't it buy up student debt? Uh, if you can't pay people directly uh, to relieve it, have the Fed hold that debt and not individuals. Mm -hmm. There are free tuition. I mean, UC used to be free, for example. And the restructuring of, of, of education, this is a moment, like just as I cannot imagine, although it'll probably happen, that we can't, that employer-based healthcare, how can we have employer-based healthcare? This is showing what a sham that is. Even though there are many unions that spent a long time bargaining for, because they didn't get pay raises, but they got good benefits. Well, one of the tragedies of the decline of, or the failure of social democracy in this country at, at the end of World War II is that we didn't get universal insurance or healthcare, which was on the table, but lost. Mm -hmm. Well, we have another moment when we can say, no, we don't want Obamacare. And we, we want universal care because a US version of uh, what we found in Britain with the National Health Service, whatever happened, was on the table in the, uh, mid 1940s. So it is really important to go back and say, yes, because our enemy, the people who would increase inequality, they are trying to use this crisis precisely for, to push their agenda, but we need to seize this crisis and be bold in our reforms that are more than reforms, but a transformation of way of life. Juliana, to, uh, to you, you know, in, in the, the stories you're writing and the workers that you're talking to in Philadelphia, do, what possibilities are they seeing? I mean, do some of these things are, that we're hearing here resonating about, I mean, we're talking about rethinking about the relationship between workers and employers around healthcare. I mean, that's a big structural change, but, you know, and at, the, at the ground level, are you hearing these kinds of discussions or other sort of similar possibilities for bigger reform coming out of the labor movement? Well, I think something that's interesting that I've noticed is that workers who hadn't normally thought about their relationship with their employer as antagonistic are starting to see it that way. Mm. Um, they're sort of coming to terms with how little rights they actually have on the job. So we have this, um, this like portal on our website of the Inquirer where people can just submit questions that they have. And we got a lot of questions from people saying, you know, my employer's um, forcing me to come to work during the pandemic, uh, is that allowed? And um, what are my rights during, during the pandemic if I have to come to work? And like, uh, does my employer, mm. is there a responsibility of my employer to keep me safe? Um, or like, is it allowed for them to fire me if I'm not gonna, if I don't, if I don't want to come to work because I don't feel safe? And uh, and I, I worked up a bunch of stories um, answering these people's questions. But the questions, I mean, the answers to the questions were largely, you don't have very many rights. Um, you know, you can your employer can fire you for any reason at any time. Um, the CDC might have. Uh, a guideline that your employer tells you if there's a positive case on the job, but there's no one that's enforcing that. So it's completely left up to your employer. And so I think that 
people are like there's you know low wage workers have known this for a while um, that their employers like see them as disposable but I think um, other kinds of workers are like coming to terms with that as for solutions um, I don't know it's I, I think it's hard I think so in Philly, there's been a group of unions and um, worker center, like alt labor groups that came together to put, to put together like a, a list of demands from, from the city, asking for the city to um, like do testing for all essential workers and to come up with anti-retaliation measures, meaning like if workers don't want to come to work uh, because they feel sick, they shouldn't be fired. And uh, it's, it's unclear right now if any of these local protections are going to be put into place. But I think it's interesting that we're seeing um, the labor movement in Philly come together around these demands. Though, and, and, and you know, there, there hasn't been much that's really united the labor movement, at least in Philly. Um, mm. People are in their own factions. Right. Um, or there's like the progressive unions and the progressive like groups are together, but then there's other unions that are doing their own thing. And we're still seeing that to some extent. So, um, so yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see if there's really this like united front of labor. I want to remind people that you're listening to COVID Calls with my guests today, Eileen Boris, Sylvia Federici, and Juliana Feliciano Reyes. Juliana, let me stay with you for a second. I, my guest yesterday was uh, political scientist Don Kettle, who's written a great new book about federalism um, and the sort of the ways that federalism has kind of put us into this predicament to a certain degree. And I wanna, I wanna ask this question to you first, because I'm curious in this moment, are workers finding when they are turning to the state for the enforcement of, of laws, for you know, whatever they may be looking for, um, document claims against their employers, benefits, whatever it may be. Where are they finding real help? Is it at the municipal level? Is it, is it in the city? Is it um, in the, at the state level, whatever, you know, states, departments of labor in Pennsylvania, or is that, I hesitate to even ask this at this point, but the National Labor Relations Board or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration or other federal agencies, where are they turning to for real help in this moment, in this very tangled array of federalism that we have in America with so many sort of confusing agencies, I think, uh, makes it hard to know where to, where to turn. What's the perspective from labor? Yeah, so, so pre-pandemic, I think we, in Philly, largely uh, we've seen workers turning to the city. Um, there's very little on a state level and very, very little on the federal level. Um, Philly has actually, over the last two years, made a name for itself nationally passing progressive worker laws, though it's lagged on enforcement. Um, but during, you know, during the pandemic, there hasn't, I, I haven't seen much of, by way of like workers going to the city and really getting what they need from the city. I think mm -hmm what I've seen is workers organizing and pressuring their employer to, um, to meet their demands. Um, so we saw like Philly port workers threatened, uh, threatened a strike and finally got some like safety precautions. Um, SEPTA workers also threatened going on strike. So that, so yeah, it, it's largely been worker driven. Same question um, to you, Eileen, or to, to Sylvia. I know you're both experts in, in this area. I mean, Eileen, you've written a lot about, you know, thought a lot about these these agencies and what role they, yeah. they can play. Yeah. Are we seeing any possibility for reform in the state at this moment? Well, this is, these bills of rights, like the, the domestic workers won in Philadelphia, which they had won earlier in California. Right now, I've been working with the California Coalition uh, of the California Domestic Workers Coalition uh, on a bill that uh, Elena Maria Durazo, uh, former union head, head of the immigrant, David Hodder immigrant, uh, uh, who's now uh, in the state legislature from LA. And this bill, SB 1257, if anyone's listening from California, uh, would end the exclusion of domestic and other household workers 
from a Cal OSHA and they're excluded uh, from OSHA. Now, what does that really mean? It, it's really important to end exclusions symbolically, uh, but it gives, uh, an, it's an organizing moment because enforcement lags. But the only way any of these uh, laws get enforced was, either, was by either in what today we call NGOs and unions pushing. It's the insider outside. It's about workers feeling that they have someone on their back at their back so they can lodge a complaint. It's only when you have this been ideas floated around to have worker health and safety councils within every workplace that have worker control of being able to go to the employer and collectively report the employer. But, and this was done uh, actually uh, in some of the uh, responses for janitorial uh, and farm worker sexual harassment in California, uh, that there were worker groups and worker education of other workers. And yes, the complaint system uh, was used, but that is the juridical system is very long, drawn out. Mm -hmm. And by then someone can be dead or starved or deported. So it's really this pressure, it's a dialectic mm -hmm. of uh, what I've called uh, uh, strikes and standards or protest and, uh, and agencies that working together as an intermediate moment can uh, both educate the few employers that don't see it, uh, that are well-meaning perhaps, you can say, well, they're being, they just don't know. Um, but also to push those who most who feel like, you know, it's in their interest to just squeeze every ounce out of, out of a worker to make it more costly for them. And so it is educating the public, public, but it's also to create the standards with the threat of walking out and of collective action behind it. And the, the Philadelphia Domestic Worker Bill of Rights actually went into effect today. Oh, wow, okay, good timing. Uh, Sylvia, um, I wanna ask a question. It's actually, it's for all of you. Um, we're coming up on time, but I definitely wanna get this question in. So I'm a historian. And I'm always worried about um, our attention span and our inability to build the archive in the moment. Yeah. The things that we need to be collecting, the discussions we need to be having, and the things we need to keep. Um, you know, you've been in this struggle and in this fight your whole career. And so I know you've been thinking along these lines. And Sylvia, let me ask you this question first. I mean, what do we? What practices do we need to be doing right now to not let this moment slip away? What are some of the tangible, concrete things that people can be doing? Um, you know, you've talked about structural change, but we also need to build the archive in this moment so that 10 years from now, we don't forget all of the tensions and possibilities of this time. Can you advise us on this? Well, I think, you know, much has already been said about what people are doing. I, and uh, it really a lot depends on the context. I have been writing a lot about the commons, for instance, the principle of the commons, by looking at experiences that I've seen women carrying on, for example, in some areas of Latin America, for example, in Argentina, um, particularly in areas that will be called like favela, where poor people live, where informal workers and so on. And one of my last experiences when I was in Buenos Aires visiting this uh, favela called uh, 24, 20, 24, was um, talking with women who in response to a, an epidemic of dengue fever. Mm. Right? They have begun to organize very massively in the community to figure out what is going on in the community, what is the people are lacking, what is that we can do. And they began to organize these structures from below that I was talking about, right? For example, checking on people, um, organizing with the children, making sure they'll be able to go to school because there was no absolutely no services. Okay, this of course is a particular experience, mm -hmm. but something along those lines, the ability to, in a sense, not think only in terms of the state, 
I think we have to make all the struggles the need at the municipal, at the city, at the national level. We need to make and pressure for all the things, you know, for example, in terms of housing, in terms of students, free education, all the things that have been talked about, particularly in terms of against every policy of exclusion. You know, and against, for example, all the policies, the racism that is built mm -hmm. into our system, which is now really at the source mm -hmm. of so many of the deaths in black communities and immigrant community. So we really need to push the state. We need to organize on another, but at the same time, at the same time, we also need to reconstitute the community. Because today we talk about community, but we don't have community. I mean, in New mm. York, it's very, very rare to speak. There's been such a destruction of communities. There's been such a fragmentation of life. And that is what has to be rebuilt. And the power of those women was precisely that, to realize that that's what they needed to do. And it was not a question of replacing the state, but it was a question of creating the kind of network and relationship in the community that would allow them to confront the state from a position of power. Mm -hmm. And that began with re-examining reproduction, re-examining and refusing to deal with the reproduction of everyday life as a purely individual question. Me, my family, the people I care for, forget about all the others. And instead begin to see that on every level, whether it is healthcare, whether it is food, whether it is the children, schooling, daycare, you really have to work from below also to decide what is that we want? What is health? When we go to the hospital, it's very important universal care, but we also know what a drama it is to go to the hospital, right? Because they have a protocol as to what they consider is good for you. What is therapy? What is health? Mm -hmm. And we want to be able instead to decide what does it mean to be healthy? And also all the work of prevention. You know, at the turn I discovered at the turn of the 19th century in the United States, people spoke about every person a doctor and there was a lot of communal organizing around healthcare and prevention. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to recuperate that. We need to recuperate the collective spirit and the spirit of, yeah, we want to be protagonists in deciding, you know, and confront the state not from a position of weakness individually, but from a position of strength. And that, as I said, starts with reorganizing the way mm -hmm. we ourselves. Juliana, you're pulling more than your weight as a journalist, uh, helping us document this moment for sure, but kind of a variant of that same question to you. Um, how can people, how should people be showing solidarity with journalists right now? Subscribe to your local newspaper. Okay. Uh, yeah. Everybody hear that? Subscribe to your local newspaper right now. I mean, we are, journalists are also really under, I mean, there's been so many layoffs and furloughs and um, publication closures over the last um, month and a half. So uh, as we're covering the crisis, we're also uh, um, targets of the crisis. So it, it's, it's been hard. And I think something that I'm thinking about too, um, just in terms of like documenting is is the public's like taste for reading these stories going to disappear? You know, like if I write about all these different kinds of essential workers and the problems they're facing, like does that story get old um, on like day 50? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's been one of the challenges right now is like how to keep it, um, how to keep people's attention. Mm -hmm. Eileen, I'm gonna um, give that question to you for the final word of our discussion in this question of memory really right. you know we've inherited this past but we also need to be attentive to remembering right now so that we don't forget it going and creating forward. our own archives right uh, and i know some people who are journaling uh who are keeping photos uh who are recollecting so the the archive is always partial and so one of the questions becomes whose archives 
who gets to be counted. And so the fact that some journalists are doing an amazing job of getting some people's voices into the public sphere is really essential. People who, uh, I do worry sometimes uh, that uh, some authorities will you know, pick up uh, an immigrant worker who's on television or who's quoted in the newspaper. And we have to think of the ethics of, of testifying and of testimonial. But it behooves us in this era of social media to, to gather because what we think is there may not be there in five years. So that's, that's a real problem. So what are you gonna do with your daily conversations? How are you going to archive them when the technology changes? These are questions that we all have to ask, but we are no different than, than our 19th or even our 18th century predecessors who in living in the struggle, some, some saved and some didn't. And we just have to recognize all our truths, our, um, our truths. I wanna remind people you've been listening to COVID calls and on Monday, we will continue this discussion of labor and the pandemic with Jessica Meyerson, Andrew Russell and Levin Sell. And I wanna really, really thank uh, Eileen Boris and Sylvia Federici and Juliana Feliciano Reyes for taking this hour on May Day and sharing solidarity and knowledge with us. And I wish you all health uh, and keep in contact. And I hope we get a chance to talk to you. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances, but again, thank you for the seriousness and the creativity that you brought to this conversation today. Stay healthy, everyone. And thank you for tuning in to COVID Calls. Stay healthy, stay sad, and thank you. Thank you. Bye. Namaste. Yeah.